Welcome to the podcast of Remo, the Researcher Mental Health Observatory. In the previous season of this podcast, we have heard the stories of three brave researchers who came forward to share their struggles on their journey through academia. In this season, we meet three guests who bring a different perspective. They talk about the reality of academia today, both at personal and systemic level, commenting on what works and what doesn't, and most importantly, on how to move forward. In other words, they contribute to a transformation of the research ecosystem to benefit well-being and mental health of the professionals, the people who work in it. Quote, we refuse to see things for what they are and ask why. We want to envision things that never were and ask why not. I am Federica Bressan and I welcome you on this podcast. Welcome everybody and welcome to our guest, Luca Viganò, professor in cybersecurity at King's College London. Welcome, Luca. Thank you for accepting my invitation to be on the podcast today. Hi, Federica. The pleasure is all mine. Besides being a professor in cybersecurity, you are an experienced supervisor as well as a former coordinator of a PhD program. And that is why today we talk about mentorship. The mentor or supervisor is a key figure in everybody's PhD journey because a PhD is a training program. It's a program where you learn and your primary teacher is your mentor. The mentor is your ally in the transformation from first-year PhD student to young scientist. And ideally, the mentor does so much more than transmitting a practical know-how that is in fact more and more outsourced to other courses. How to write a paper, how to write a grant application, how to write a CV. The mentor introduces you to the scientific community and helps you build your own network. The mentor transmits the academic culture. They don't necessarily teach you with words. They transmit by virtue of working side by side for years. For this reason, some people still call the mentor their academic father or mother. So deep is their imprint on the way they do research and the scientists they are. However, so many PhD students lament a terrible relationship with their mentor, with disastrous consequences on their PhD work and on their personal well-being. Sometimes this seems to be the number one complaint from PhD students. Does your experience reflect this, Luca? And if so, what is your experience? A PhD is a complex thing because it changes from country to country. So I've worked in four different countries, in academia in four different countries, Italy, my own country, Germany, Switzerland, and UK. And there are many, many differences ranging from the number of years that are dedicated to a PhD. So some countries say you must be done in three years. Some other countries are much more open and allow five or even six or even more years to how you actually study, whether you have to take some courses or whether you simply do research. However, there are some fundamental points in common. And one of these points is actually what you already mentioned, namely the fact that you're going to have a mentor, a supervisor, in some cases, even a team of mentors and supervisors who are going to help the PhD student transition from student to independent researcher. Now, the figure of the mentor or the supervisor or the boss because in some cases, actually, that person is the boss of the student in the sense that is funding the scholarship, but is also supervising concretely the research and is actually even going to assess the quality of the research. That is a fundamental figure. And what I have observed is that in many cases, mentors, supervisors, academics don't really understand one fundamental point, namely the fact that it's not the case that the student is working for them. Yes, they might be subsidizing the student, they might be paying the scholarship of the student. That is true. But the main point is actually that the supervisor is working for the student. 
That to me is the standpoint that every good mentor, supervisor, boss, however you want to call it, lab director, that is the, the standpoint, the point of view, the, the, the spirit that every good mentor must have. The notion that the mentor works for the student and almost not the other way around is very interesting. Why is that exactly? Because ultimately, the student is going to spend a few years with us and then ideally progress on their own independent career. And obviously, we need to make sure that they get the best service possible, that they learn from us, and that it is not just learning like monkeys do by imitation. So, you know, it's not just that they observe what we do and they replicate that, but it's much, much deeper than that. It's a collaboration that requires a lot of investment. Which is why, for instance, I always marvel at my colleagues who have a large number of PhD students because I've never been able to do that myself. And how many is many PhD students? So I have seen colleagues who supervise at the same time more than 10 PhD students. I've seen even cases with 15 or 20. Now, of course, When that is the case, there is typically a group that is supporting the work. Typically, there are some postdocs who are helping, some other academics who are helping. But to me, that is, it is questionable whether that is really providing a good service to the student. Now, it's great if the PhD student is embedded in a research group. It's great if they have other people to talk to in addition to the supervisor, maybe a postdoc helping with the project, helping with the work, maybe some other PhD student with whom they're sharing part of the research and they work together. But ultimately, the main relationship and where the responsibility lies, that is with the mentor and the supervisor. So the happiest PhD students I have seen and the most successful ones are the ones who really have a close working relationship with their mentor, with their supervisor, where not only they spend enough time together, you know, not just a weekly or monthly or in some cases even bi-monthly meeting, but they, they have the opportunity to work together, to sit side by side, which in... In the age of the pandemic might be complicated, but there are ways to do that even online, you know, to spend time together and learn not just by imitation, but by doing things together, by discussing, in some cases, even by challenging what the mentor is saying in order to understand what is the best way forward. That requires a huge investment of time and of energy by the mentor and the supervisor. I do appreciate that many colleagues won't have that amount of time. And it is natural, it happens. But then my suggestion or my point of view would be to say then they should try and reduce the number of students in order to be able to really work with them rather than simply meeting them once in a while to give some feedback on a a draft of a paper that the student has written. It is a two-way contract, after all. This is what I'm trying to say. So, yes, the student is working in the team of the mentor, but, yes, the mentor is working for the student, helping them to really mature into early career researchers who are able to carry out the work independently. And besides differences from country to country, are there differences between disciplines, for example? Of course, there are differences from discipline to discipline. So I'm a computer scientist. I work in cybersecurity. And my experience is going to be totally different from, let's say, uh, somebody working in a health discipline, uh, doing experiments in a lab. So I cannot pretend that, or I cannot even assume that I'm going to be able to speak for, uh, for all of these different disciplines, all of these different cases. But I think that the main spirit is probably going to be very, very similar. And that is something that requires not just an investment by the single supervisor, but it requires a context where to make that happen. For instance, my experience with different European countries is that these days, and things are different from when I started. So I I started my PhD 25 years ago. 
and things were very different than in certain countries, but not so much in Germany where I did my PhD, where I had a first supervisor, but I also had a second supervisor and we would have regular meetings. And this is, for instance, what happens at King's College London, where I work now, where the student is assigned a team of three academics with whom the student meets regularly. Typically, there are regular meetings with the first and the second supervisor who typically are involved in a related discipline so that the second supervisor can also contribute to the actual content of the research. But then we also assign a a third, let's say, mentor, panelist, supervisor, however you want to call it, with whom the students meet typically every six months. And we try to make sure that that person is somebody from the same field, so computer science, but not necessarily working in the same topic. So for instance, in my case, if my student is working on cybersecurity problem, we would get another academic working, I don't know, in algorithms, in software engineering, in uh, human computer interaction. Because ultimately the PhD thesis and the PhD work will need to be understandable also by other researchers. And therefore, it's important to get somebody else's opinion. But at the same time, the fact that you have somebody who is actually working on a not closely related topic means that they will be able to give advice that the supervisor, that the first supervisor and even the second supervisor who are so embedded in the research area might not be able to give. So provided that kind of context also basically sends a good message to the mentor and the supervisor, first of all, that they're not alone, that they can share part of the burden with some colleagues. And in many cases, I've seen colleagues really be helpful for both the students and the mentor. But it also gives a rhythm and a context where things happen. Now, in different countries, there will be different structures. In different disciplines, there will be different structures. But these are the key points, namely making sure that the mentor and the supervisor is well aware of their responsibilities and creating an environment that supports the fulfillment of these responsibilities. We have established that the mentor or mentors is or are key to the scientific development of the PhD student. But this is also a human relationship. And whatever goes wrong with it will not only impact the student's productivity, but also his or her well-being. And that of the supervisor, for that matter. (laughs) We're just focusing on the students right now. So what are the main issues, professional or personal, that students were seeking help with when you were coordinator of the PhD program? which was a privileged position because you were sort of a meta-supervisor, someone to go to when you have trouble with your own supervisor. And you could also observe the work and conduct of your colleagues. So what was that like? As coordinator of a doctoral college or as director of a doctoral college, depending on what the name is in different countries, you have responsibilities and duties both with respect to the mentors and supervisors and to the students. Part of your work is to make sure that the supervisors do actually their job. You know, they uh, have regular meetings with the students, they help them progress. But another part of the work is to make sure that students don't feel abandoned by their supervisors. And that happens, unfortunately, more often than we would like. Notice that the sense of abandonment does not necessarily mean that they're not meeting with the supervisor, but rather that the quality of the meetings that they have with the supervisor is not what the student would expect. And there, my role as coordinator of the doctoral college has been basically to act as a mediator, in some cases even as a glue between the student and the supervisor. In some cases, it meant making sure that students are aware of what it is okay to expect from the supervisor. In some cases, especially at the beginning of their PhD research, students might expect a little bit too much. Uh, And that is fine. It's something that they can learn and it's something that uh, should be discussed. You know, what, what is a regular rhythm? What is a good regular rhythm for meetings and the like? 
But the most important thing is really the quality of the meetings and the quality of the supervisions. Doing a PhD research is a lonely job in the sense that it is ultimately the student who is going to write the thesis, even though in some cases I've seen some of my colleagues go actually way and uh, and above their duties and beyond their duties in order to help the student write the thesis, but that is fine. But ultimately, it is the student writing their own piece of research. So it is a lonely job. But the importance of the supervisor and the importance of the coordinator of the doctoral college is to make sure that the students feel supported, that they don't feel abandoned. And in that case, you know, it is important to have a discussion with the student, but also a discussion with the supervisor, maybe suggesting ways in which they can improve on the quality of the supervision. In some cases, supervisors are not even aware of that because students are too afraid to speak out and, 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 and ask the students for better or more supervision. So the work as coordinator is really to try and make sure that student and supervisor get back in sync that the students don't feel abandoned because ultimately you don't want students to to interrupt their studies or even to stop their studies because they don't feel they, they're getting the supervision that they deserve. But at the same time, also do a reality check with the supervisor on what is possible and enable exactly that. Correct. Like you pointed out, sometimes when people turned to you, they may have been too afraid to speak to their supervisors, but maybe they had already spoken with their supervisors and they got nothing out of it. So in both cases, we have two orders of problems. One is the main issue, and secondly, trust and communication. So I'm curious to know, what other issues besides feeling or being abandoned were students coming to you with, which means issues that they had unsuccessfully previously discussed with their supervisors or didn't have the courage to? Um, I received two kinds of complaints. So one kind or the first kind of complaint that I received was the one in which the student really lamented that the supervisor didn't have time for them, that the supervisor met with them, you know, once every, uh, once in a while, maybe even once a week, but for 10 minutes or something like that. And basically the student felt that these meetings were not really helping. Basically they felt that the supervisor was ticking the boxes. Yes, I've met with the student, but not really giving advice or feedback or comments that would be helpful for the student. In that case, the most important thing is to have a chat with the supervisor, maybe even with the student present, you know, in a... um, Part of the role is to be like a couple's counselor where you try to make sure that they actually talk with each other and that they listen to each other. In some cases, the students were too afraid to speak Mm -hmm. and complain with the supervisor. So my role was then one uh, to, to, to really report on what the student has said, maybe using, you know, accommodating words and then constructive words, but make sure that the feelings were conveyed. The second kind is when actually the communication had taken place between student and supervisor, but things were not improved. And that is where I believe the major challenge lies. And ultimately, that might lead, you know, to the student asking to be supervised by somebody else or to the supervisor saying, you know, uh, I, I don't want to supervise you anymore. Please talk to my other colleagues and find another supervisor. And in some cases, that has turned out to be the perfect solution for both parties involved. You know, student has found another supervisor and then went on to do a fantastic PhD. But in some other cases, it has led to the student abandoning their studies. And ultimately, you don't want that to happen. Well, unless it is really a conscious decision. You know, you don't need a PhD to be happy in life. You don't need a PhD to be successful in your career. And I've had cases, even of my own students, of uh, people who have realized after one or two years that PhD academia is actually not for them. And if that is the case, then you know, no, no contract is, is jail time. No, uh, no scholarship agreement is jail time that you need to serve. So you can, you know, find other avenues in life. 
great. But before you get to that point, it's important to try and find a good working relationship with the supervisor. What has helped in my cases, what I've seen helps is maybe to attend some meetings together with them and give advice both to the student and to the supervisor on how to actually communicate better. For instance, you know, uh, some students might find it very difficult to just get written comments. They will want to have a, a meeting in person to discuss. Some other students prefer very detailed written comments. It's very difficult to say up front, but you are there to help them find the best way out of this problem. Thank you, Luca, for sharing your thoughts and your experience with us. So in the first part of the conversation, Luca has outlined what the job of a supervisor is and what it is reasonable to expect from a supervisor. Then he has shared some of the common complaints that he has received from PhD students when he was serving as the director of a PhD school. In the second part of this conversation, Luca will talk about the strategies that may be adopted to improve a critical situation between mentor and mentee. He will talk about whether a mandatory training for supervisors may be helpful. And finally, whether we should expect that PhD supervisors be able to support their students in personal emotional struggles. See you again in the second part of this episode of the Remo podcast with our guest, Luca Viganò. Thank you for listening to this podcast. For more episodes, please check out our website at remo-network.eu. Remo is spelled R-E-M-O-network.eu. The podcast was brought to you by the Researcher Mental Health Observatory, Cost Action Number 19117. I am Federica Bressan, host and producer of this podcast. Additional audio editing by Davide Linzi. Mixing and mastering by Davide Linzi.